Free Elimination Network, short APMEN, is a network of countries and stakeholders in the Asia-Pacific region committed to working towards malaria elimination. APMEN is a network of 21 countries and multiple research organizations from the Asia-Pacific that collaboratively pursue regional malaria elimination efforts through knowledge exchange, capacity building, and generating required data and evidence. The admin talk series aims to focus key thematic areas of admin working groups and facilitate knowledge exchange around research and implementation, latest guidelines, as well as lessons learned from the field. Today's webinar will be around the implementation of G6PD testing, what diagnostics are available, what will become available in the near future, and what are the key challenges and what opportunities are there. Um, next slide, please. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, we will, thank you. We will start with a series of short talks, followed by a number of polling questions, followed by a panel discussion, and finalized by a Q&A session for presenters and panelists. So thank you very much for joining, and Ross, over to you. Hello, and many thanks for um, the introduction. So Ben, let's, uh, without further ado, let's get going with your, um, your first presentation, which is on the rationale for routine G6PD testing um, to guide... Hello, everybody. My name is Benedict Lay from the Menzies School of Health Research in Australia. Many thanks for giving me the opportunity to present at this webinar. I will provide a brief overview of why routine testing for G6PD deficiency to guide radical cure of Vivex malaria is important. The glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme, short G6PD, is a tetramer and consists of two identical dimer subunits, as you can see in the picture below. It is a ubiquitous enzyme that is found across most of the living world, apart from some archaea bacteria. Amongst other functions, in human red blood cells, the enzyme is essential to maintain the cell's pH level in response to changing blood plasma pH levels. Red blood cells with a G6PD enzyme that have low activities are at risk of hemolyzing in the presence of strong oxidants. Low levels of G6PD activity are collectively called G6PD deficiency and are conferred by a mutation in the G6PD gene. To date, more than 215 clinically relevant variants have been identified, all of which confer varying degrees of low G6PD activities. The G6PD gene is located on the X chromosome. Males have one copy of the gene and are either hemizygous deficient or normal. In contrast, females have two copies, one of which is randomly deactivated on a cellular level. Females are either homozygous deficient or normal or heterozygous for the gene. A very crude categorization by the WHO suggests that most hemi and homozygous individuals have G6PD activities below 30% activity. Heterozygous females, in contrast, can have activities spanning from almost complete deficiency to almost normal activities. Normal G6PD activity is defined above a cutoff of 60 to 80%. Following an infection with Plasmodium vivax, the parasite forms blood stages that cause symptoms, as well as metabolically inactive liver stages, so-called hypnozoites. Depending on geographic location, hypnozoites reactivate weeks to months after the first infection, causing symptomatic relapses. In some locations, relapses can make up to 80% of all vivax cases. The only class of drugs that effectively remove hypnozoites from the human host are the group of eight aminokinolines, namely the widely used primoquine and the recently licensed tafinoquine. Both drugs are strong oxidants and induce varying degrees of hemolysis in G6PD deficient patients, depending on dose provided and G6PD activity of the patient. Routine testing for G6PD deficiency to guide 8 aminoquinoline based radical cure is accordingly essential for safe administration. Depending on G6PD deficiency prevalence and the variants present in a population, the risk of drug induced hemolysis differs on a population level. In 2012, Ross Howes modeled exactly this risk for all countries worldwide that reported malaria cases. You can see the result of this modeling in the map on the slide. 
She categorized each country into one of six levels. Level one, suggesting a very low risk of drug-induced hemolysis, and level six, suggesting a very high risk of drug-induced hemolysis. As you can see from the map, she identified most of the Middle East, as well as more or less all of Asia, to fall into categories or levels five and six. So areas with very high to very high risk of drug-induced hemolysis. This histogram shows the typical distribution of G6PD activities within a population with two peaks, one around 100% activity and a second smaller one representing hemi and homozygous deficient individuals at the lower end of the G6PD activity spectrum. Depending on treatment provided, different G6PD cutoff activities apply, thereby exclu excluding different proportions of the population from the respective treatment. In this slide, only the most common radical cure treatment options are considered. Starting from the bottom, single-dose tafenoquine has only recently been introduced to the market. The drug has an approximate half-life of 15 days. A single dose of 300 mg is currently considered efficacious. Treatment effectiveness is accordingly very good. However, the drug is contraindicated in patients with G6PD activity below 70%. Low and high dose primaquine, given over 14 days, are the most widely prescribed radical cure treatment regimens to date. Neither is recommended for G6PD deficient males and females with activities of less than 30%, as well as heterozygous females with activities of less than 70%. These groups are best treated with weekly primaquine doses over the course of eight weeks. In order to identify patients above and below 30% G6PD activity requires a qualitative diagnostic. In contrast, identifying patients at the 70% threshold requires a quantitative diagnostic such as a biosensor or spectrophotometry. But what happens if radical cure is provided in the absence of routine testing? Brazil, by how is it all categorized as a level three country for hemolytic risk, follows this approach. G6PD deficiency prevalence within the Amazon is approximately 5%. A study published in late 2019 by Brito Sousa et al. assessed hospital data from Manaus for the time period from 2009 to 2017 and identified more than 110,000 cases of single or mixed Vivex infections that were treated with primaquine. The frequency of primaquine-induced hemolysis that required hospitalization was 85.2 cases per 100,000 primaquine users. One patient admitted to hospital within this cohort died as a consequence of drug-induced hemolysis. And how about heterozygous females, of whom the majority will have G6PD activities above 30% activity? Chu et al. in 2017 enrolled a total of 34 heterozygous females as well as G6PD normal wild type females who were treated with either high dose primaquine over seven days, that is a total of one milligram per kilogram per day, or a treatment period of 14 days, that is a total of 0.5 milligram per kilogram per day. None of the wild type G6PD normal females had a clinically relevant drop in hematocrete of above 25%. In contrast, in the heterozygous group receiving 14 days treatment, two out of 17 females, or 12%, had a clinically relevant hematocrit reduction of above 25%. And amongst the cohort who received one milligram per kilogram over seven days, a total of nine out of 17, or 53%, had a clinically relevant hematocrit reduction. In the same group, two females required blood transfusion. Finally, I would like to present to you the case of a G6PD deficient male from Bangladesh who was provided with primaquine based radical cure. A male with the Mediterranean G6PD variant that confers severe G6PD deficiency was provided with standard primaquine treatment according to national treatment guidelines that is a total of 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per day over 14 days and he was instructed to take the entire treatment over the course of two weeks. 
However, he ended up taking the fourfold higher dose, so a total of one milligram per kilogram per day, due to a misunderstanding. The boy had to be admitted to hospital after four days with a very low HP of six milligrams per deciliter and was provided with two blood transfusions and eventually recovered fully. Given these examples, it is of course interesting to understand why testing is not performed more broadly in malaria endemic countries to guide primaquine based radical cure. This was assessed in a series of interviews with policy decision makers and healthcare deliverers in Bangladesh, Cambodia and China, where no testing is done, as well as in Malaysia, where testing is done on a routine basis. Among countries where no testing was done, the main reason for doing so identified were, for one, a low perceived risk of drug-induced hemolysis within the population, as well as the perception that Vivex malaria is benign and radical cure is not considered a priority. And finally, it often was the fear of additional costs that prevented rolling out routine G6PD testing. And this brings me to the end of my talk. Many thanks for your attention. Okay, so we will be taking questions to the talks at the end of this session. Let me next introduce to you Dr. Ari Munasti Satyagraha, who is a senior researcher at the Aikman Institute for Molecular Biology in Jakarta, Indonesia. Her main research areas are G6PD deficiency, biochemistry, genotyping, and diagnostics of the malaria parasite, as well as neonatal jaundice and red blood cell membrane disorders. Today, she will be talking about test formats to diagnose G6PD deficiency that are currently on the market. Okay. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Ben. Um, can I start now? Yes. So I'll be talking about um, what are the G6PD test formats that are available on the on the market today. Uh, can I have the next slide? Yeah. So there are two types of G6PD diagnostics. Uh, there are the quantitative ones and qualitative tests. The quantitative tests are the ones that can give you the actual numbers uh, that is in units per gram hemoglobin. And basically, you can take this type of test and bring it to the population study, and then you can actually set your own 100% um, threshold based on the median of, that, uh, of G6PD activity on the populations. And then you can uh, set, based on that calculations, 10, 30, 70% uh, cutoffs for your particular uh, populations. And because of this, these types of um, tests can differentiate G6PD heterozygous women. Well, if you see from the previous presenters, um, Dr. Ben, uh, ben Lay, he said that um, G6PD heterozygous women, especially those uh, can be um, either really deficient or they can also have intermediate activities and normal activities. So those intermediate nor uh, to normals are the ones that um, are difficult to diagnose except when you're using quantitative tests. And especially quantitative tests is needed for high dose primaquine therapy or tepenaquine. But for the quantitative test, you normally need an adequate laboratorial settings as well as technical skills to do the test. Um, hold on. And also it's very costly and some, um, most of the reagents are, um, they need refrigerations. So um, that's one of the pros uh, and cons of the quantitative test. Whereas the qualitative test, it gives you a yes or no answer in, in terms of uh, primacrine therapy. So when, you, um, when, there, the, when the result says no, it's deficient, that means you cannot give the therapy. And if it's normal, then yes, you could give the therapy. And again, as Ben said, it's sensitive only for the very, very deficient G6PD uh, individuals, the, uh, the ones that are intermediate, sometimes you don't see this. And they were considered as normal. But most of the qualitative tests do not need uh, specialized equipment. Um, they are cheaper, but this again depends on countries. And mostly they don't need refrigerations. Um, and because of this, they have shorter shelf life. Okay, next slide. 
So for the quantitative tests that are available on the market today, there are different types. There are the spectrophotometric ones, and these are considered as the gold standard. Um, it actually uses the innate capacity or ability of um, NADPH. Um, this is the products where, G6, uh, where G6PD uh, enzyme um, chemical reactions is. So because it's low rest at 340 nanometers, so you use that and the amount or the intensity of the fluorescence you can actually measure to calculate the activity of G6PD enzyme. Um, and there are different uh, brands like Randox, Point Scientific, uh, you also see RND Diagnostics from Greece. Um, there used to be a Trinity Biotech that has been widely used across the world, but it's now been discontinued and we are actually replacing it with Point Scientific. Uh, because of the because spectrophotometric is really difficult, you need an actual lab to do it and um, a really good lab technician to do this. You cannot bring this test to the field, and this actually rural areas are where um, this these XPD tests are needed because those are the malaria endemic ones. Um, so you need a point of care test. There are two so far that uh, are available on the market. Um, one is the point of care test from SD Biosensor, and the other one is from CareStock Biosensor. The SD Biosensor requires 10 microliters of blood, um, really fast processing uh, time, two minutes, and it can give you the G6PD activity as well as the hemoglobin um, measurement. Um, Whereas the care start biosensor, it requires less blood, which is only five microliters, but uh, double the time of processing, four minutes, and it gives you only the G6PD activity. So you, for the hemoglobin value, you would have to use a hemoq, and then you have to use that, and then you recalculate it so you get your G6PD activity for this. So there are additional steps uh, for a care start biosensor. And next slide, please. And there are um, studies already comparing SD biosensors with the gold standard point scientific. Uh, the one that I have here actually from Samba Pal from PATH. Um, and there are others like from Dr. Um, Alam, uh, Dr. Alam's uh, paper. But um, both tests, uh, both papers showed that um, SD biosensor is comparable to point scientific. If you see panel A, um, I think, yeah, sample, uh, some papel actually compared SD biosensor with the point, uh, point scientific as the reference. And you see that both tests, um, SD biosensor can accurately say which one is deficient, which one is intermediate, and which ones are normal. And when um, they also measured um, SD biosensor hemoglobin uh, measurements and compared that with the HemoQ, also you see a good correlations. And when you look at the sensitivity test um, at 30% threshold, SD biosensor is very, very sensitive. It's almost 100%. But when you bring it up to 70% threshold, the sensitivity is still um, high, still pretty close to 100. So what we can see from here is that SD biosensor is comparable to point scientific, especially when it's going to be used as a point of care. Can I have the next slide, please? So the qualitative tests that are available, there are a couple, but I'm going to mention a few that are quite common. The fluorescent spot test or FST, this has been recommended by the WHO for a long time. This test is already, I think already started, has been there, I think in the 80s, 70s. So it has been used for a long time. Um, it used 10 microliters of blood. Um, the processing time is about 15 minutes. However, with this test, you do need some sort of a lab. Uh, you do need lab skills and you do need specialized equipment such as incubators. You need a uh, long range uh, UV lamp. You need a dark room, if not um, a viewing room to, uh, where you can see the result safely, but it is WHO recommended. Whereas the Care Start RDT, this is quite easy. It's similar concept with the malaria care start RDT. So you just put the uh, blood and then add the buffer and then you just let it through. Uh, it's a lateral flow format, um, which relies on the reductions of the colorless uh, nitro um, blue tetrazolium dye that is converted to purple when, it's, um, when there are enzyme activity. 
So if you have a colorless um, cassette, then you, what you have is the deficient one. And if it's purple, then it's normal. However, the shelf life is only one year. Um, whereas in, it's, it's, it's actually making it quite difficult in terms of logistics in some countries. Um, Binax now is also has been around for a long time, um, but it, from all of the tests that I know, Binax now is the one that requires the most um, blood samples, 50 microliters. Uh, the processing time is between five to seven minutes. It's again, quite easy to do. Uh, and it is, I think the only one that is FDA approved so far. Uh, but on the cassette, it's written that um, the test should be done within 25 to 30 degrees. So again, this is not something that you could use as a point of care in the tropics where the normal temperature is above 35 degrees Celsius. Okay, um, next slide. Our group has done comparisons um, between FST and Care Start RDT, and we did this in collaborations with Dr. Uh, Professor Kevin Baird's group. Um, where we actually um, divide the males and the females in terms of RDT and FST, and we compared this to the gold standard at that time, which is uh, which was Trinity Biotech, and both the RDT and the FST in both males and females are pretty sensitive. Um, it's almost 100% uh, sensitivity up uh, at 30% um, threshold. But when you go down. With the males, you can still uh, uh, see high sensitivity of the test, but the sensitivity is greatly reduced when, in, when detecting females. Uh, so again, this is what uh, the, uh, with Ben said earlier in his presentations, and this is what we found in our presentation, uh, in our uh, study. Next slide, please. So to conclude, ideally, um, we, we would like to have a G6PD diagnostic that is affordable, especially for third world countries, that is accurate, point of care, easy to use and interpret, and has a long shelf life. But from the both platforms, both the quantitative and the qualitative tests that we have, they each have their own pros and cons. So again, uh, it depends on the countries which type of test they want to, to, to use. Uh, with the SD biosensor, we know that it is comparable to Point Scientific as a quantitative point of care test for G6PD. However, I think more studies should be done to ensure this. Um, whereas the Care Start RDT G6PD is comparable to FST, and both now have been recommended by the WHO for screening G6PD. And I think that's all from me. Uh, thank you for your attention. Great. Many thanks, Ari. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Domingo, um, Gonzalo Domingo, uh, who is the Senior Scientific Officer at PATH. Um, Gonzalo has fostered a portfolio of diagnostic technologies, working with private and public sector partners to advance novel diagnostics from early research and development to in-country availability. And he's now going to talk to us about some of the products in the pipeline. Thank you, Gonzalo. Thank you very much to Admin for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some of the limitations of the tests that we have, repeating a little bit of what, what Ari said and talking about what's coming in the pipeline that um, will hopefully address some of those limitations. Um, but it is worthwhile remembering that um, a few years ago, we didn't have any options, and it's very exciting to see that we have now some point of care tests available in the field and that are going through actually quite um, quite strong regulatory pathways um, to ensure their quality. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll, we'll repeat the differentiation between the qualitative and quantitative tests because it is important. We have been using qualitative tests to manage um, Plasmodium vivax with Primoquin for a long time through the fluorescent spot test and other qualitative tests that have been available. Um, and they, they do give us the ability to very safely and robustly um, exclude from treatment 
those hemizygous males that are deficient with less than 30% and, and those females with less than 30%. But Ari did point out something that when you look at the data closely, um, actually it's more, it's higher than 30%. Um, so th um, the, the threshold that they, um, at which they can exclude people from treatment. So, um, and, and they had, when applied, properly interpreted properly, they have been shown to be very safe for, for the primocrine doses that have been available until recently. Um, with the newer doses of primocrine and, and definitely with tofenoquine, there is a requirement to be able to um, exclude those females that have intermediate activities. And these two histograms show the typical distributions of males and females in a population where males can be G6PD deficient or normal, but females because of that heterozygous um, uh, genotype can have G6PD activity that spans from deficient to normals. Um, and you, you really want to be able to um, exclude those with intermediates from, from cosenus or, or tofenoquine uh, as per the label. Um, and, and quantitative tests or semi-quantitative tests that can tell you that someone's deficient or intermediate um, the aim is to be able to differentiate um, those um, in contrast to a qualitative test that only can really tell you uh, uh, whether someone's deficient or, or normal. If we go to the next slide, please. As mentioned by Ari, we, we do actually have a few qualitative tests. The, the, the most predominantly used one and the one that has been used very successfully for many years, but is, is requires laboratory infrastructure is the fluorescent spot test. Um, but um, Access Bio um, several years ago came out with the Care Start product. Um, and and Binax, as Ari had mentioned, um, is another qualitative test that has been made available and has gone through the FDA. The, 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 the limitations with qualitative tests is that they're actually very difficult to make because you want them to behave the same at 20 degrees as at 37 degrees. And what we've shown is actually when you look at, when you run a deficient sample at 37 degrees, um, because of the enzyme activity increases with temperature, it looks a lot like a, a, a norm, like how um, the signal you'd interpret with a normal. So it's very hard to make a qualitative test that's easy to use, very affordable, but actually is robust across a hard temperature test. When you compare it to what we call a target product profile, which is really a document that's, that um, lists the product specifications, the kind of performance characteristics we want for a diagnostic test that will support Plasmodium vivax um, case management. What we find with the tests are, qualitative tests that are available, they are easy to use. The interpretation, the coloration aspect is quite challenging um, to interpret. And, and actually, you know, with, with malaria tests, you can have a scorecard with the lines and that's very difficult to do with um, coloring windows. And so that has been a challenge. The operating temperature range is not ideal because it's very hard to make something that's gonna work in a air conditioned room and as well gonna work in a, a, a more, um, remote setting that doesn't have air conditioning that is exposed to tropical temperatures. And then unfortunately to date, the, the, the qualitative tests that have been available don't have a control line. So you don't have a, a ability to know if a test is invalid or not. And there has been very little um, available in terms of controls to verify that the, the kit that you're using is still working or not. Um, and that's quite challenging when you're trying to implement quality assurance um, programs to go with your G6PD testing. If we go to the next slide. So it is very exciting to see that companies are responding to that and we are seeing things coming through that look quite promising. Access Bio is working on a new generation of the care starts that has got lines instead of um, a, a window that changes coloring. Um, there's a company in um, the Republic of Korea um, who masters that is also making a, a two um, that's also making um, a, a two window one window for control and one window to differentiate deficient and normal and then more logic in the UK has also been working in a line um, representation interpretation of um, G6PD deficiency um, and, and normal 
And then we have demonstrated previously that you can actually use recombinant G6P8D enzyme and lyophilize it and, and stabilize it for a year at, at unitized volumes. Um, so, you know, you only use one tube per, per test and, and that can be used as a control. That still is a little bit away from being a, a commercial product, but we've definitely been using it in clinical studies and, and supporting um, some of the development efforts that are going on. Then if we go to the quantitative test, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, as mentioned by Ari, that the two products that have been kind of developed to really meet this market are um, the, um, the biosensor from, from CareStart and our Access Bio, which um, does only measure G6PD activity and doesn't normalize to, to hemoglobin, um, but is easy to use. And then there's the biosensor, um, the standard G6PD test from ST Biosensor, um, also out of South Korea, that actually measures G6PD activity normalized for hemoglobin. And they have developed unitized control reagents that you can use. You know, it's, there's a little tablet at the bottom of those tubes um, that you use one tablet per per um, strip, and, and you test a, a high and a low control. In terms of ease of use, um, the the SD biosensor is actually quite easy to use, but it is a little bit more complex than than the qualitative test um, from the perspective that you do need to do a a license step before you go into the disposable. The interpretation, it's interesting. Um, it, it's a numerical interpretation, then you have to correlate that to deficient or intermediate. Um, I think um, from, from the usability data, and it'll be interesting to see what, um, what comes out of these next years, um, it may be easier or harder to interpret um, than, than the qualitative tests, especially the, the, the window coloration interpretations. Um, it has been shown, and we have shown this, that it, it can work over operate, a wide operating temperature. And that's because actually the instrument allows um, the test to be, to be recalibrated depending on the temperature it's been run at. And, and so the SD biosensor, for example, has a temperature um, has a temperature monitor and then it can recalibrate the, 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 the results in terms of, um, in terms of um, correcting for temperature. Limitation is the, the storage and shelf life. At the moment, it's at 12 months. They're trying to extend that, but it, um, uh, um, this is a, a limitation for G6PD tests um, because these are enzyme-based assays. They have got slightly more labile reagents or, or substrates. And, and, and that's a, a, a challenge. And as I mentioned, then in the case of SD Biosensor, they do have um, controls um, that are, have been unitized. Um, if we go to the next slide. So what are we seeing um, in terms of what's coming down the line to, to address some of these things? Well, manufacturers are exploring the possibility of a smaller number of units per kit to um, manage a little bit the, 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 the shorter shelf life. It doesn't totally solve the problem, but it does re it may result in less wastage. Um, there's alternate platforms coming up um, that may have different stability profiles. For example, there's a manufacturer working on a portable spectroscopy approach and the, um, the, the biosensor from Kestarts on an electrochemistry platform. It's actually quite interesting from a diagnostic perspective to see so many different platforms being applied um, for point of care solutions. And, um, and we do know of, of at least two other dedicated efforts, the spectroscopy effort and this um, biosensor from a company in, in New Jersey, IVDS, that uses the same principle as the SD biosensor. Um, those are deliberately targeting the, the malaria case management um, use scenario. There's another product that's entered the market um, that's microfluidic in nature. It isn't targeting, it's, it's, it's extremely expensive, but it's good to see that the industry is making these products now more available. The idea of point of care G6PD deficiency is becoming, um, it's been seen as a, as a market. Um, 
And then from the um, ease of use and interpretation, I, um, we do know that, um, for example, SD Biosensor is looking at, uh, at facilit as improving the, the workflow. And um, there are a, a set of tools and, and documents like easy guides that are, are, um, are being made available to facilitate training and, and um, and um, and and sort of training and ensuring that people can interpret the res the, the the tests accurately and and easily. And we are making those available, for example, at, at our um, website. So if we go to the last slide, I think with that I would like to kind of finish with on a note that you know many years ago. Um, there were no products available, and it's very exciting to see that um, these companies have stepped up and are, are making these products available. There are limitations in, in these products, but at least we have things that we can try and work out and and see how we can use them, um, and also um, work with the manufacturers to try to improve the, thing, the shortcomings of these new current gen generation of products. So thank you very much, Gonzalo, for this really interesting presentation. Our last presentation for today will be given by Christian Gergo, who is a qualitative researcher and lecturer, lecturer at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. He explores the making of health interventions through participatory and ethnographic methodologies in marginalized communities. Today, he will be talking about user perceptions on a quantitative G6PD biosensor by healthcare deliverers in Bangladesh. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, today I will presenting briefly a qualitative study that we did in Bangladesh. Um, it was a study done in collaboration with FIND, ICDRB, Manzines and Maastricht University. Uh, what we did is uh, we looked at user perspectives as well as some policy considerations for the implementation of a quantitative GCSP test in Bangladesh. Um, you saw it as well in Dr. Gonzalo's presentation. I will talk briefly about it uh, in, a, in a second. Unfortunately, I will have to go over some of the slides um, and nuances of the study quite quickly, but I thought it might be useful to also leave some of them in case and you would like to revisit the study or the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a background info on PVIVAX in Bangladesh. The key points are that there is progress as well as an agenda towards elimination, uh, but there is an uneven distribution of malaria. Um, and I will talk about this a bit more later. Uh, next slide, please. So the objectives of the study were to investigate user perspectives on the standard G6PD biosensor, um, as well as experiences and challenges of testing for malaria. Look how the new test might change the feasibility and preferences with regard to testing and treating malaria um, and the implications for technology design and aspects of implementation. Uh, also, we looked at some potential implications for, for, for health equity um, and what uh, implications might it have for patients as well as health workers um, in routine uh, practice. Uh, next slide, please. So we looked at a training day on using the SD biosensor conducted with two different groups of medical technologists, uh, which are the equivalent of medical technicians in international jargon. Um, and the training they focused on the theoretical and practical sessions and the trainings were also followed by focus group discussions in which we, we discussed their experiences with, with it. Um, next slide, please. So this is just a quick breakdown, breakdown of the participants and research activities. Uh, in addition to focus group discussions, we did interviews with medical technologists, a few doctors and nurses and NMEP officers uh, and BRAC officers. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so now to the main findings. Um, 
when it came to the use of the biosensor, the main, th the main things that participants appreciated about it were the usefulness, portability, and general ease of use. Uh, they did like to compare it with uh, glucometer tests, um, and that was a positive thing. But there were also a few areas where its use came with some challenges related to maybe collecting the blood sam samples using the buffer, um, which might lead to receiving an error from the machine and having, the, uh, having to repeat the test. So some of the participants that thought that with practice it would get easier, but they talked about these challenges in the context of, of a very busy clinic um, where, um, you know, later on we observed that they juggle a lot of other activities, responsibilities at the same time. Um, so, you know, that they have to conduct tests, communicate with doctors and nurses and patients. Uh, and while they would have to generally have to have an assistant to help them with these activities, many labs do, do not have um, this support. Uh, there were also some concerns over supply chains and, and uh, shelf life. Uh, for example, if a device takes longer to reach the health complex, um, you know, a device which technically might have a long shelf life can become a shorter dura duration device. Um, next slide, please. So in the context of elimination in Bangladesh, um, decision makers and health workers believe that the test for G6PD deficiency would be beneficial for patients and, and also necessary to reach the target of 2030, um, as well as for the implementation of a more radical uh, and efficient uh, cure. However, this would require a lot of coordination at all levels of the health system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was mostly due to the always shifting requirements that malaria uh, requires. Uh, as it moves geographically and seasonally, there are conflict uh, or remote areas, or there are more difficult to reach areas by health workers. Uh, there are different infrastructure. You know, here we can talk about storage uh, aspects um, of health complexes, uh, but we can also talk about things like communication and travel infrastructure, which can change during monsoon periods uh, and in specific more remote areas. Uh, patients and health workers can have different experiences with malaria. You know, for example, some of them, um, for some of them, it, it might nearly disappear from day-to-day -day practice. Um, or it can be something that they, you know, work uh, quite often uh, and they are very used to, to looking at. Um, and this has to do with how it is distributed in, in, in Bangladesh and how these changes are occurring. Um, there is a certain level of flexibility and improvisation that we observed and that is needed and done by both policymakers and health workers. Um, and these shifting requir requirements need, uh, need a nuanced discussion around flexibility and standardization of implementing uh, the, the test. So a question that might need to be addressed is what resources are required, which aspects of implementation, the, uh, implementing the biosensor can um, or would fall outside of, you know, setting stones, um, guides and standardized models for implementation. Um, next slide, please. One thing that we wanted to look at um, was the aspect of in introducing the biosensor and the training that would have to, uh, and the training that would uh, accompany the biosensor, um, especially in areas where less or fewer PVIVAX patients are present. Participants recommended that refresher, refresher trainings would be provided every six months. Um, to account for the monsoon periods when there are more patients, but also for the, the more dry season when, when there's not so many patients. Um, so the question of what level of the healthcare system should be conducting GCSPD was also a heatedly debated one. Uh, we noticed, uh, because in practice, we noticed a high level of coordination between nurses doctors and lab technologists to diagnose and treat. Um, and even community level health workers were involved because many malaria patients are now diagnosed and treated at community level. 
from where only the severe uh, patients are referred to higher levels of the healthcare system. So um, if the biosensor is only implemented at these higher levels, then patients would have to re be referred from the community level um, in the absence of usual symptoms of severe malaria cases. So this would require a change in how risk and severity of PVIVAX are seen in routine care. Uh, because most patients, for example, would be used to, be, to have to travel only if they have really severe uh, symptoms. Um, and for this, it was interesting to see how the training itself not only helped lab, lab technologists use the biosensor, but how it changed how they interpret the risks of p -Vivax. Uh, Next slide, please. So these are just some of the considerations that came um, with the, uh, for the implementation and how the test would fit, uh, would fit in the um, healthcare system of Bangladesh. Some questions would be, what are the diagnostic, diagnostic technologies that exist already? How are they distributed you know, at community level, at uh, higher levels like Upazila healthcare uh, complexes? Uh, who should be implementing the test? Uh, how does the referral system work? And how would this, uh, the, the, the test change that as well? Um, and then what kind of meanings does the, the test have for different users? Because we saw you know, it can be seen as a tool for better care. It can be related to one's expertise uh, and professional role in the healthcare system. Uh, it can be a way to support funding for NGOs or um, you know, also can be a challenge in, in the sense that it can increase workload in already strained work environments. Um, and all this kind of need to be um, yeah, included in any implementation plan. Again, that discussion of flexibility and standardization. Next slide, please. Um, this is a bit of a longer discussion, but the main aspect of it is how do priorities, uh, are how are priorities negotiated in implementing? So you can have too many uh, patients, uh, which can obviously be uh, an implication for uh, already uh, crowded workplace, uh, but also in terms of costs and distribution. Um, next slide. But there can also be too few patients in the sense that, you know, any change in the uh, routine work would require new, um, new effort at policy level, new effort in terms of training, um, and then it can become a, a bit of a less priority uh, to implement it. Um, also, in, in, in relation to uh, PFOS Iparum, so that's something that came across in quite a few uh, interviews. Next slide, please. Um, so also this raised a lot of, um, uh, well, necessities in terms of data needs, what kind of information is required to make the biosensor um, seen as relevant um, and and important um, because this kind of data can drive uh, funding and maintain testing and treatment infrastructure uh, and uphold that political will and leadership. So the actual produ produ production production of of this data and information are is connected to its implementation quite a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, these are just some conclusions and future work. Um, it requires new forms of evidence. Um, it requires the uh, health infrastructure and systems, um, re functioning relationships. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, this is just some some areas that would require some further investigation. Further investigation. Um, how long will the perception of uh, health workers that are doing the trainings will last? Uh, especially in perhaps in areas where there's um, uh, there are lesser numbers of patients with p -Vivax. Um Will the patients travel between healthcare system, um, between the different levels of healthcare system for the GCPD testing, or would it have to be in, uh, introduced at community level? Um, what kind of stakeholders would have to be included in the implementation? Um, next slide, please. 
um, it would be uh, good to look into all these kind of relationships um, and actually to explore the implementation in practice um, rather than only in advance. Um, next slide, slide, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for going really fast over the different slides, uh, but I thought maybe some of this discussion might provide some food for thought for the panel discussion as well. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Christian. That was a, a lot of information that you managed to convey there. Um, and like you say, all of these talks are aimed to um, sort of provide food for thought for the discussions to come. Um, so a big thank you to Ben, Ari, Gonzalo, and Christian for, um, for your talks and contributions and for setting the scene nicely for the, the discussions to come. Um, before moving to the panel discussions, um, we'd first like to ask you, the participants, a few questions. So we have four questions, um, which will hopefully appear seamlessly on your screens. Um, and the idea is, again, that they will trigger kind of further, dis further thoughts for you um, and questions for the discussions afterwards. And as a reminder, um, please do um, submit questions through the Q&A box at the bottom. And then once there are questions there, you can um, upvote different ones um, according to what you think will be most useful to discuss. Um, so the first question. This one is specifically targeted for um, participants who are closely associated with national control programs or who are working in specific countries. So just to get a first kind of feel for what this, the current status of G6PD testing in your country is, please could you select one of those options? So they range from G6PD testing being widely available to, um, to not yet being available to um, not being considered necessary. So just click on one of the um, one of the options, and then the results should pop up. Okay, can we see the results of that poll, please? Okay, so the principal result then, which I think you should be able to see here, 53% of um, the respondents indicated that testing is not yet available but the Ministry of Health considers this important and is prioritizing the implementation. Um, in 18%, it was widely available. Um, and in 28%, um, it's kind of been hindered by complexities around logistics and costs and so on. So that's really useful, thank you. So next question um, is also for the, please could we have the next polling question? Thank you, is, is for the same group of participants who are closely linked to a specific country. Um, so for those where G6P testing is sort of being planned, what kind of testing would you envisage being used? So qualitative assays, quantitative or a combination of the two. So this is in your specific setting. Okay, and please could we have the results? Okay, so main result then is that it would be a, a qualitative assay is what's been considered, but um, potentially also quant quantitative assay. And there seems to be less um, interest at this point in a combination of assays, um, including a, both a qualitative and a quantitative assay. This is really interesting. Thank you. Um, can we have the next one up, please? This question is now more for um, participants who are involved in clinical trials or research studies that are involving G6PD diagnostics. Um, 
what type of again what type of testing are you using as part of your studies um, rapid tests quantitative rapid tests spectrophotometry molecular or combinations of the above Great. Um, please, can we have the results to this poll? Combinations of the above. That makes a lot of sense. So perhaps in confirmatory testing, um, but the the biosensors and the the quantitative rapid tests are um, more commonly used at the moment than 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 the qualitative rapid tests. These obviously are just um, giving us a, a a rough snapshot across the participants today. But this, these are really interesting. Um, okay, so then the final poll before we join the panelists for the discussion, please, could we have that? This is for everyone. Um, and this kind of feeds off perhaps some of the, the, the things that Christian touched on in his presentation. Um, G6PD testing will be necessary to implement the new um, radical cure treatments. And what do you think will be two of the key barriers to um, providing or the, the difficulties towards um, ensuring widespread G6PD testing? Please select up to two, two of these things that you think may be considerations, potential hurdles. Again, these will perhaps provide some discussion thoughts for the, the panels afterwards. Um, please, could we have the results now? Interesting. So lots of these are coming up as, as hot topics. Um, supply chains and how to actually ensure access for patients. Um, funding. Some concerns about you know, organizing trainings and so on. Okay, so that's a really, that's an interesting snapshot of several different considerations. Okay, Ben, over to you. Okay, thanks, so yeah, well, many, many thanks for your answers. That's really interesting. Um, we will now have a panel discussion and I'm very grateful to the following country representatives that constitute today's panel. There is Dr. Anup Andika, who is a medical doctor and senior scientist at the National Institute of Malaria Research in India. Welcome. His research has revolved around developing diagnostics, clinical development of anti-malarials and operational research. He established a WHO testing laboratory for malaria RDTs and has implemented a pharmacovigilance system for anti-malarials in India. There is also Dr. Moses Laman who is the head of the Vector-Borne Disease Unit and Deputy Director for Science and Research at the Papua New Guinea uh, Institute of Medical Research. Welcome again. Over the past 14 years, he has led a number of anti-malarial anti drug studies and field-based epidemiological studies that have contributed to the development of malaria and vector-borne policies in PNG and the Pacific region. Dr. Moses works closely with the PNG National Malaria Control Program and has strong links to the provincial health authorities in PNG. And there is also Dr. Welcome. So, and there is also Dr. Kindi Penjor, who's a medical doctor as well with a public health specialization. He's currently working as an epidemiologist on special assignments to the Vector Borne Disease Control Program, Department of Public Health, the Ministry of Health in Bhutan. His research interests include malaria, vector borne disease, and human rabies prevention. So again, thank you very much for your time and for joining this panel today. Let me start off with a quite general question. Um, Dr. Anoop, what test policy do you currently have for reducing or mitigating the risk of drug-induced hemolysis in India? Uh, thank you, Ben. So in India, the national program recommends to carry out G6PD test wherever the facilities are available. And it is carried out at the higher centers. If the facilities are not available, then we still give 14 day primaquine in the standard dose of 0.25 milligram per kg per day. And the patients are asked 
to report back in case they develop any symptoms that are suggestive of hemolysis like high colored urine or blue coloration of lips etc and primaquin is stopped in such cases and the patient is treated accordingly at the health facility level and uh, uh, in india primaquin is provided even at the village level by, uh, by our community health workers uh, known as ashas so there is thank you very much thank you very much that's very interesting um and dr moses how is that being handled in png thank you ben uh, for png at present uh, this experiment testing is not yet um recommended as part of the national standard treatment guidelines existing data uh, suggests that the prevalence of this experiment deficiency in papua new guinea is about 4 to 5% but because of the many challenges on the ground some of them um, are kind of related to what um, christian presented uh, in in this uh, recent session and so because of those um, it is not yet feasible clinical uh, practice in our setting um although under research conditions there have been um a number of qualitative um, um tests being used like the bionex now and kesta targeted point of care test have been used in our setting uh, but those including the fluorescent spot test are not not available as part of routine clinic uh clinical practice in, in the alka system in png okay great so so no routine testing so far thank you very much and dr kimli how is that being handled in bhutan uh, i think you're still on mute can can you could you just unmute unmute yourself thank you thank you uh thank you for having me in this panel i hope i'm able, you are able to hear me now yes okay so as far as bhutan is concerned uh, bhutan has been on malaria elimination strive since 2013 and uh, it is one of the 21 countries uh, to eliminate malaria by 2020 that is part of who e2020 countries uh but unfortunately this year we seem to have an uh, outbreak in one of the districts uh, which may affect the achievement of this target so uh, coming straight uh, to the questions uh, the malaria uh, treatment policy and diagnosis is guided by the national treatment guideline which was first produced by the program in 2009 and uh, specifically there is no mention of uh, need to do disease pt testing in the treatment protocol and therefore uh, till now uh, no disease pt test is done uh, for any pb cases and but uh, 14 days uh, treatment regimen is given without test so far but uh, we revised the guideline last year 2019 which is not endorsed officially yet so uh, we did put the, the need to do gcp testing from now on but uh, as of now currently officially there is uh, no gcp testing that is there in the health facilities or it is being done so this is the status uh, as of now on gcp testing in bhutan great thank you very much um and just sort of following on from that i mean you've touched on some of this but already but um when you are considering introducing routine gcp testing um what types of test formats so we've heard about the qualitative and the quantitative ones um are you thinking of introducing for different health system levels um dr moses should we start with you thank you um bros so for for papua new guinea yes the national malaria control program is um um thinking of introducing routine this expedit testing but because of those uh, many practical challenges on the ground uh, the program still wants uh, to investigate feasibility of um, exploring the, the clinical utility of those tests and and finding ways to to and so we overcome some of those very practical challenges before this can be uh, this can be implemented and so we we had a lot of those uh, previous discussions and those are related and relevant to our setting as well not just the affordability or accuracy or or making it feel deployable so that it's point of care and 
easy to be used because of the remoteness and geographic locations throughout the country and the endemicity of malaria is more pronounced in rural settings more than in urban where you, you have those, um, you have the benefit of having um, better infrastructure. And so those are realities um, that, that the program wants to really understand before this is done. And so it is actually asking if it would be possible for us to, you know, do feasibility studies as well and to find out these factors and the need to carry out uh, those feasibility studies will be important to inform the National Malaria Control Program about the implementation and scaling up of what is possible at different levels of our healthcare system. Um, and, and so the program really sees this as, as a priority, but we need to understand those, those realities first before this can be done. Sure, that makes good sense. Um, and Dr. Kinley, what's the situation in Bhutan? Uh, yes, uh, as I said in my answer to the question number one, uh, we the program has uh, made a decision to introduce the test uh, and we have put that in the national guidelines in 2019. But I'm sorry to again uh, take COVID-19 as an excuse because of this COVID-19 COVID lockdown and restrictions, uh, the, the official endorsement of the, the, the recommendations and guidelines is not yet uh, done. So because so, of so this... The, uh, yeah, yeah. And, but which, which type of test format are you thinking of, of um, implementing and is being included in the guidelines? Was it more the qualitative or the quantitative formats? Yeah, for now uh, we have uh, we have uh, decided to uh, do with the qualitative test. One because uh, this test is already used as part of a neonatal screening program at the national hospital, so that will uh, save us from this uh, having to go through this uh, regulatory process. So it is already there in the uh, medicines and drug list. So, but. Uh, once we really implement, I think uh, we can learn the feasibility and all that. But for now, uh, we are uh, thinking about uh, using a qualitative test. Great. And um, Dr. Anoop? Yeah, uh, thank you. Rola. So we are already conducting the G6PD testing in selected government as well as private hospitals. And these tests are mostly laboratory based. And if we want, if we how to expand the G6PD testing access, then we will definitely need a suitable, reliable, and also affordable point of care test. And that should be very easy to use even by the peripheral health workers. See, we have the fleet of over 1 million ASHAs who are conducting an RDT at the field level and uh, providing treatment and including Primaquin. So, so much easy should be the test ideally. And we have a wide range of healthcare infrastructure ranging from tertiary care hospitals to the primary care hospitals. And also the services are provided at the village level. Hence it is possible that whenever the tests will be introduced universally, there will be different formats in the different setups. And as we know, the qualitative, most of the quantitative G6 period tests, they require a device and it will be difficult to provide the devices at all the village levels. So, the quantitative tests might be placed at a facility level and uh, qualitative tests may be used at the village level, but then it will all depend on what type of tests are available uh, and all. Great, so thank you very much. Um, right following on and talking a little bit more about uh, the practical implementation of routine G6PD testing. Where do you see the main challenges of introducing routine testing and within Bhutan, Dr. Kindi, for example? Uh, yes, uh, I would like, like to uh, begin by saying that uh, I said qualitative test, but uh, I think uh, one, it will depend on the level of health facilities. In Bhutan, the southern part is the, 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 where the main malaria focus is as of now. And uh, we have a different level of health facilities, which is a primary care and then uh, 
district and then regional level. So I think uh, our decision will be based on uh, the level of health facilities, the quantitative versus qualitative test. Uh, in terms of challenges, uh, as I said, Bhutan is in an elimination phase. And since 2015-16, our cases are below, uh, below 100. Last year, it was uh, just 42 cases. And of that, uh, majority are as expected uh, last body and five cases. So because of the few cases, I think uh, one of the challenges would be the cost effectiveness of the test. Because uh, we want to introduce the test, but uh, at the same time, uh, we want to minimize the wastages or expiry of the test. Uh, uh, and uh, we would like to optimize the use of the test and to ensure that it is available and used where it is uh, should be used. And uh, the other challenges are around uh, uh, acceptability by the clinicians. So as I said, uh, we have been giving Prima in 14 days without testing for last many years. And uh, based on the clinical experience, uh, our colleagues tell us that there is no problem with the GC, uh, uh, Prima Quinn, uh, therapy without test, as they have not seen any uh, incidence of uh, hemolytic anemia. So they feel uh, our, what we are currently doing is uh, enough. So they, we may have to convince on why it should be uh, introduced now. Of course, the third test, I think, is around the quality of the test and the cost of the test. But as far as cost is concerned, I think for Bhutan, it will not be a major consideration, mainly because of the uh, of the few number of uh, cases that we now have. So I, I foresee uh, these are some of the issues that we are thinking and should think. Yeah, yeah I understand. Thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Anoop, in contrast in India, where do you see the main barriers to rolling out routine G6PD testing? Well, I think if we are making the test mandatory, then it should not uh, create a hindrance for the universal primaquine access, which is there at the moment. So, Ms. G6PD testing cannot be introduced at all the facilities in one go. We will have to go from the referral hospitals to the village level very gradually. And there could be various challenges like first is changing the routine case management practice as is there since many, many years. And uh, uh, we have succeeded in declining the malaria burden uh, throughout the country. Then this will also involve using the test results to determine the radical cure. So which itself uh, is a challenge, training the people, making the tests available at all the levels. Then considering the relatively shorter shelf life of these tests and the declining malaria cases in India, supply chain management uh, will definitely be an issue. And of course, this will definitely need uh, funds, not only for the testing, but for training, and for implementation of these tests. And uh, as a Bangladesh uh, study has shown us, we will definitely require implementation research in order to understand how best we can introduce G6PD testing, particularly at the village levels, because in the hospital settings, it's not that difficult. Means uh, one is just doing the test and after the results are uh, available, the medicine is given to the patient, but this does not happen at the village level. And we might need to modify our system a bit and then scale up. We'll also need to try some innovative approaches. Say, for example, if we are going in for a quantitative test, then we might have to uh, do the testing through mobile clinics because it will not be available at all the villages. And we might need uh, some strategies like patient cards or something like that. Yep. And I think you mentioned a really interesting aspect of saying we can have the best diagnostics ever as long as the result is not being translated into practice. They're probably not much good. So thank you very much for that. Um, and Dr. Moses, um, if you think of the situation in PNG, what do you think are the, the greatest hindrances there? Yeah. So uh, probably related, similar to what the other speakers have said, once if an, if an affordable and, and uh, accurate and you know, field deployable type of test is available for us, the, 
Other main limitation would be the practical challenges relating to how best we, we can, because of uh, lack of capacity on the ground as well, to related to how we can implement and sustain the rollout and, and um, of the, and, and there are many related uh, challenges like procurement, supply chain, storage, cost, and uh, financing of the tests so forth. Um, and also it will be important for the health workforce in, in PNG, Health service, primary health care is provided mostly by primary health care workers like nurses and um, community health workers rather than doctors. And so uh, training and retraining of, of uh, the cut, this cadre of health workers so that they're able to uh, perform these tests would be some of those uh, practical challenges. And, and there's a wide variation in cl clinical practice between the primary health care and hospitals and of course the private and so tailoring this according to those different um, health systems also will be important uh, for, for Papua New Guinea. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. These are really interesting discussions. Um, we're now going to move to the broader Q&A session. Um, so could I ask the presenters to switch on their videos as well and join the discussion? Um, and as a reminder, you can type questions into the um, Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And you can also then vote on questions that you think would be priority ones for the panels um, to discuss. Um, thanks, everyone. <laughs> it's a great screen to have <laughs> all your faces. Um, so one, let's start with, um, with a question <clears throat> about the, this mix of diagnostics and so it's sort of been touched on a bit in the discussion just now. Um, is the limited interest in having a blend of qualitative and quantitative tests due to perhaps a lack of understanding of the potential gendered needs to do so? Um, would any of you like to take a lead on answering that? So, yeah, it is the limited interest perhaps at the country level of, of using both qualitative and quantitative assays um, linked to the kind of complexity of the female um, heterozygote status not being so well understood in, as a different risk to, um, to males who have a much more clear cut um, phenotype. Ari, do, do you think that's an issue in, in Indonesia, for example? Um, I don't think it's an issue because the issue is actually the cost of the, the diagnostics. So uh, if you have a, if you have to have two, two types of tests, uh, I don't think it's possible. But I'm speaking from my own point of view in terms of the logistics. But if you are having to choose, I would say, probably the quantitative, not a blend of the two. Because it's still, the logistics would be different. If you're using a qualitative test that you know the shelf life is really short, and with Indonesia being really vast, and you know, like you have to deploy so many, by the time they receive the, um, the kits, I would just imagine it's only two more months left of the shelf life. But if you, but that's that's why having to, a blend of the two is not really an issue rather than the cost and logistics of providing both of them i think um they know that um the females um they know that uh, qualitative tests the rdt for example can eliminate those that are really really um deficient so the ones that really you should not even give um, primaquine or malaria therapy. But however, with the women, um, the heterozygous women, we don't know the degree of severity. So I don't think they, at the moment, they they care about buying the quantitative just to, ice, to diagnose for females. I think that's my point of view. I don't know. Thank you, Barbara. I have, oh, sorry. It's it's not really a, a, an answer, but it's more a question back. And I was wondering if at international level, when it comes to funding and distribution of funding and attention to priorities, um, there's a quite a strong move 
towards gendered approaches and gender equity. Um, do you think that can sort of play a role in directing attention towards specific um, tests, whether quantitative or qualitative? Is that something you've noticed that drives that discussion? Gonzalo, maybe this is also something that I don't know you could comment on. I apologize. My my Zoom had just frozen for a moment. Um, so I, I froze when Ari was talking about the logistics of, of implementing um, both. Um, Christine. Um, yeah, uh, so it was more a question that sort of back to, uh, to Rosalind's question. Um, and I was wondering if you saw a, a move in international focus uh, and decision making regarding um, which biosensor gets, or sorry, which type of testing gets uh, priority. Um, because you know there, there's a strong move towards a gendered equity and and uh, gender fo gendered focus in uh, in projects and implementation. And I was wondering if that's one of the drivers um, that that focused attention towards specific types of of G six P testing. Um, yeah, I don't know if. I do have just a couple of comments. Um, one thing that is important to appreciate is that for the regimens of primaquine that we've been using, um, the qualitative tests work equally well. From a research perspective, if you want to understand um, the qualitative test does disregard the fact that there are females with intermediate activity, and so you end up with a um, with a, a knowledge gap or a research gap, but from a clinical perspective with 14-day primaquine, low-dose primaquine, you can treat, um, you know, there, there, is no, there is no actual um, concern about the risk. It's when you talk about the new treatments that are driving, um, the, that are driving the, um, the requirement um, to have a quantitative test and without which then you do start getting um, a sex-related inequity, but I think, yeah. Great, thank you very much. And so I have a different question from, from the audience um, that is to Dr. Anub actually. Um, the question was, could you elaborate a little bit more on the G6PD testing and malaria treatment in referral sites? Yeah, thank, thank you for this question. So in India, uh, there are two services are provided by miss they are provided by the public uh, health sector and also by the private health sector so in private health sector particularly in the urban areas uh, people the clinicians they go for a quantitative g6pd test so they will be going for the spectro uh, photometric uh, assay and uh, at the government hospitals also, miss, uh, they will be either going for this assay or they will be going for some another test uh, in the, uh, the dye reduction test or DPIP test or uh, fluorescent spot test, uh, depending upon the uh, facility available over there. And, and the patient is asked, uh, miss, once the report is ready, then, then Prima Queen is administered to the patient. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we've got another audience question um, in relation to the challenges of the supply chain logistics. <laughs> Given the shorter shelf life of G6PD tests compared to the longer shelf life of malaria RDTs, there can be challenges for programs to balance quantification and distribution planning so as to have enough tests for use while trying to keep expiries to a minimum or with the goal to ensure that the supply of G6PD tests is in place so as to enable a successful uptake of these novel diagnostics. Um, quite a challenge. Um, would one of the country experts like to take this on? Or Gonzalo, perhaps? Uh, 
Um, Dr. Kinley, is this something? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. No, I can I can only just confirm that yes, the short life is significantly shorter than the malaria RDT. So it's a very valid question, but I can't talk to the country problems that that are people on the panel. Yeah, Dr. Kinley, is this something that you've discussed as part of your planning for introducing this? Uh, we have not really uh, specifically discussed on this, but uh, as I heard from the presentations, uh, so at least you have a shelf life of one year, if I heard the presenters correct. So if it is at least one year, I think, uh, and given our cases number are small, and uh, our annual procurement and quantification is one year cycle, so we do it annually. And our focus is going to be mainly in the south, in the in the selected districts and health facilities. So considering this, uh, I think this will not be a major uh, practical problem for Bhutan. Uh, the, the, the one year shelf life. But having said that, I think uh, having a longer shelf life is always better for the program. Kimi, I have a second question also from the audience on Bhutan, but I think it's more general, also applicable to, to any setting that nears malaria elimination. So the question was, in Bhutan with so few cases, would it not be better to institute some form of DOT directly observed treatment and follow up of patients taking Prima Green rather than doing testing and sending patients home? Uh, the, the, this is very correct. So we have few cases and uh, I just would like to say that the DOT, the directly observed treatment is very much in place uh, since 2011, 13. So it is there, but uh, the quality of DOTs, how we have implemented this and uh, that is not very good, I would say. And finding a good DOT provider is a challenge. We do have that clearly mentioned in the guidelines and even in uh, the program related documents. But how did this is really done in the field is something uh, I think that is also a challenge. So therefore, uh, we thought, and also because it is recommended as part of a good clinical practice by WHO, which is also only ethical to, to consider patient safety point of view. So we thought, uh, and because the cost is not going to be really high for the program, so we have uh, uh, provisionally thought we'll introduce this uh, GCSPT testing for our P5X patients. But uh, the dots will be there and along with the, uh, the, the drug efficacy follow part of our IDES. So that is there. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, we've been told multiple times to stick to the timeline and I'm quite proud to say we have. So um, we're coming to the end of this webinar. Thank you so much for an interesting discussion and for all of you attending this. Um, as usual, we ask for some feedback. So we have three short polling questions on how you like the webinar, what we could improve in the future and so on and so forth. If any, probably these questions do not cover everything. So we greatly appreciate any other feedback you have shoot us an email whenever you feel like if there's additional questions we're more than happy to um, forward these to any of the panelists or presenters as well so but coming back to the questions um so the first question is this webinar's usefulness to you and your organization was it poor average good or excellent um the second question is what was the overall quality of this webinar again not sure poor average good or excellent and the final question is Will you attend the next admin webinars, if your time permits? Yes, no, or maybe. And okay, and then if we can see the results, please. A bit like a school report. <laughs> exactly. So, and then otherwise, again, Thank you very much for, for coming and contributing. And I'll hand over to Ross for the final words. Thank you very much. Yeah, just to echo Ben, um, a big thank you to everyone for your participation and your contributions um, to today's seminar of the questions and the different polls. 
Um, in particular, a big thank you to our panelists, Dr. Kinley, Dr. Moses, and Dr. Anoop for your insights from um, country implementation perspectives, and to um, Ari, Gonzalo, Christian, for your insights from the R&D um, and um, research perspectives. And also to Ben, of course, um, for all your work planning this seminar, and thank you for bringing us all together, especially in a year when we can't all meet up in person. Um, finally, thank you to Chris and Phone from Appleman for making all this happen through your organizational support and um, fantastic tech capacities, making all this run so smoothly. So thank you very much again, and we look forward to the next Tech Talk. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.